Lockdowns and bosonization uh, today. Uh, at the end of the last class, we uh, talked about a consistency check. Okay, so you remember, right? Let me remind you. Um, you remember that we had these um, bosons. So we were working with alpha prime equals 2. The, the general formula for PL slash R, which was N by R plus minus WR by alpha prime. Okay. That became uh, N uh, plus minus W by 2. Be uh, at uh, when we, sorry, N by R, WR. And then we focused on R equals 1. We looked at R, R is equal to 1. So we got uh, N plus minus W by 2. Right? This is clear, right? This you remember. Um, and uh, <coughs> we claimed that this theory of bosons at r equals 1, r is equal to 1 by root 2 times the self-dual radius. Because the self-dual radius in this, this unit is r. A self-dual radius is r is equal to, have I even told you what? Yeah, we've talked about t-duality, right? Yeah, so r, um, r is equal to square root alpha prime is the uh, self-dual radius. Alpha prime is 2. So square root 2 is the self-dual radius. This is 1 by 2 of the self-dual radius. Or equivalently, two times the self-dual radius. Right? Because by t-duality, these are the same theories. Okay, we were looking at the at at, uh, at this particular at this particular location, and uh, the correspondence was that psi was equal to e to the power i h, and uh, psi bar was equal to e to the power minus i h. We showed last time that these this correspondence gave us the same correlation functions for all insertions of e to the power i h and e to the power um, psi and psi bar with e to the pi h and e to the pump minus i by h. We showed that the stress tensor worked, you know, everything worked nicely. Um, we basically saw that in the NS sector we got the same theories. For NS sector, were we putting w equal to 0? Um, NS sector we are putting, no. So, okay, good. So NS sector is um, even, um, even momentum. So w doesn't, it needn't be 0, but it has to be even. Right. Okay. Good. And um, uh, and we got uh, 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 we got this match. And then the end of the last class, we started talking about the other sect. Okay. Uh, yeah. Physically see. Um. Yeah. Um. Tell me a little bit what you might want to see. I, I mean, I don't have anything very clear to say, but maybe if I hear what you would like, maybe I'll have some. Well, Boson, we, we imagine it's like a strain uh, overlap with some winding or something. So it, does it behave like fermions? Yeah. 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 Uh, You know what you could do? A question that might that might uh, um, you know a question that might um, be in your mind is how does co something that commutes change to something that anti commutes? Okay, this you can figure out using this ba the Baker Campbell Hausdorff identity. Let me leave this to you as a little exercise. You see. Um, we have uh, that h of z, h of 0 is equal to uh, uh, minus half log z. This is for the uh, holomorphic part. In general, we got a, uh, uh, what, sorry, we had alpha prime by 2 is, is the half rate. What was the general correlation? What? Alpha prime by 2. So then we get minus 1 My, because alpha prime is 2. Right? We got log z times log z, log z, z bar. But the z bar part doesn't matter for the holomorphic part of it. OK? So we've got this h of z, h of 0 is equal to minus log z. OK? And uh, uh, from this, this is a time ordered correlation function. But from this, you can compute the, the commutator between h and h. Now, we've discussed a lot how to compute these commutators when there is a pole in the OP. 
Here, instead of a pole, we have a log in the OP. Okay? Now, this log would also give rise to a commutator, but a commutator of the theta function sort. You know, the, the commutator will be one thing if z is larger than z prime, and another thing z is less than z prime. I'm going to leave it to you to work out the details, or we, we can talk about it next class if you, if you are still confused. Okay, now, using the commutator between h of z and h of 0, figure out from this, you can now compute the commutator between uh, or really, in this case, the anti -commute. You can compute e to the power i h of z e to the power i h of 0. And see how this relates to e to the power i h of 0 times e to the power i h of z. Okay? And how do you do this? You use this Baker-Campbell-Hausdorff identity. Do you know this identity, which is, says that e to the power a times e to the power b is e to the power a plus b plus maybe half a commutator b and so on. Okay, and then commutator with the commutators. In this case, the commutator is very simple. It's just a C number, just a theta function. So this Baker-Campbell-Hausdorff identity terminates at the first term. Okay, so in one place you get an HZ commutator H0. The other place you get an H0 commutator HZ. Okay, so then you get different answers. And when you work it out, you see they're different exactly by a minus sign. Okay, this was not... I ducked your question, right? You were asking physically how do you see that this happens. This is not physical. Technically, this is how it happens. Um, yeah, is there something more physical to say? Yeah, that's right. That's what this calculation uh, is doing. Um, you know, there are various things you might ask. In higher dimensions, there is another sharp relationship between fermions and bosons. And this relationship is with spin. Fermions are object with half integer spin. Bosons are object with integer spin. Um, actually, this is precise from four dimensions and higher. In that situation, a simple bosonization duality is impossible. Because spin is immeasurable. So the, whether the spin is half integer or integer is, you know, just a true question, question of computing some uh, eigenvalue under a symmetry operator, like angular momentum. So you cannot interchange bosons and fermions in four dimensions at higher. In two dimensions, you know, this thing is not there for the simple reason that space is one-dimensional, so there's no spin. There's not enough place to move around. Um, yeah, so the only fermionic fermionic characteristic is this anti-commutation. Okay, and this is how you see this from um, from a, a computation. Now the condensed matter people have some way of uh, understanding this. This it has a name, right? Jordan something, Jordan sometimes something. If you, that may have some more physical explanation. Okay, let me look up this, this condensed matter way of thinking, Jordan, whatever. Uh, uh, maybe that will help. But I have nothing more to say now. Yeah? This calculation is easy to do, though, if, if that will satisfy you. Okay. Um, okay. Go on. In the last class, you said that e to the power i h by 2 uh, represents the Ramon sector. Ramon sector ground state. And Ramon sector is, uh, represents the periodic boundary condition. Correct. Correct. But if you do this, h goes to h plus 2 pi yeah. in the target plane. Mm -hmm. uh, it will be like anti-periodic, like x will go to minus x, right, after 2 pi uh, translation. x, what is x now? h, h, sorry, h. Uh, so, how do you say? Oh, uh, sorry, sorry, let me just understand your... Your question. Um, h goes to h plus 2 pi. Under that, e to the power i. Ah, uh, you're asking what happens uh, to this quantity, e to the power i h by 2. Um, 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 um. So there are two questions you may be asking. One question is, is this a valid vertex operator? Okay. And uh, 
because you might be asking that, well, how can it be a vertex operator when it doesn't respect the periodicities of a problem? Okay. However, remember that this vertex operator wasn't this. It was the thing that came from here. So we've been looking only at the left moving sector. There's also a right moving sector. So let's look at the term, the value of w that gives you e to the power h by 2. That's w is equal to 1 and n is equal to 0. Okay? So this, so if I use the ter terminology h tilde for right movers, the true vertex operator for that is e to the power minus i h tilde by 2. It's this times this. Is this clear? We have to, right? Look, uh, the original theory we started off was the compact free boson. The compact free boson had left movers and right movers. In fact, the relationship we wrote down, the PLR, is the left moving and right moving moment. Okay? So any given value of N and W specify both what the left movers are doing and what the right movers are doing. And the question is whether the vertex operator is well behaved. The composite vertex operator is well behaved. The left part by itself may not be. The right part by itself may not be. But the whole thing is. Remember, when we worked out the theory of compact bosons, we were very careful only to keep legal operators. We checked that these were the operators we got from the state operator map. And we also checked that the spectrum of operators was uh, mutually single valued. We were very careful to make sure all these consistency conditions were obeyed. So since this comes from there, it has to be obeyed. And we just saw, saw that it is. Okay? Was that your question? That this does not seem like a legal vertex operator, or did I misunderstand your question? My question was like it does not seem like it follows uh, peri uh, periodic boundary conditions. Oh, what follows periodic boundary conditions? E to the power ih by 2. Yeah, it does not. Because it's anti-periodic on the plane, and then the map from the plane to the cylinder has a has a factor of square root z in it. Yes. So it's which you could have asked the same question in the NS sector. Yes. Yes. Okay, in the NS sector, there was the vacuum or identity. Identity looked periodic, but I told you that the boundary conditions were anti-periodic for the NS sector. Uh, and the, uh, the, the, the reason that these two were consistent was that uh, in the NS sector, uh, from going from the cylinder to the plane, you have this factor of dw by del z square root. Uh, that factor is there because a uh, square root because uh, psi had dimension half. And that factor gave you a factor of, you know, some square root, which changed periodic to anti-periodic. So whether, you have to say whether periodic on the, on the plane or periodic on the cylinder. And these are different things. In, in fact, they interchanged. Is this clear? Okay, excellent. More questions, comments? Okay, so good. It's good that you... People find uh, the bosonization uh, um, non-intuitive. Now that's good because it's a surprising thing. Okay. By the way, let me make, since this question has come up, let me make a quick comment. In three dimensions, two plus one dimensions, bosonization is also possible. In fact, in many examples, it's known to be true. And here it's even more surprising than two dimensions because here particles can also carry spin. And the way it works there is that in 2 plus 1 dimensions, it's not true that spins are only integers or half integers. Let us remind ourselves why it was the case that spins could only be integers or half integers. Let's take a massive particle. Okay, this argument's clearest with a massive particle. Then you can take a massless limit if you like. Um, when you go to the rest frame of that massive particle, that particle transforms in its little group. The little group for in d dimensions, d space-time dimensions, is s o d minus 1. For d equals 4 and higher, space-time dimensions 4 and higher, the little group is s o 3 or higher. And s o 3 and higher, s o 3, s o 4, s o 5, and so on, are non-abelian groups. Now, representation theory of non-abelian groups gives you discrete unitary representations. And these representations for s o are all of the spinorial type, or of the non-spinorial type. You know, those that are well-defined in SO3 are those that need the covering group. Yeah. And all these, they have uh, under eigenvalues of any one rotation, they have either integer or half integer spits. Okay, so there's a discrete difference between representations of SO3, 
OSO4, OSO5. And so this labeling, you know, either this kind of representation or this kind of representation is a clear separation. Right? Either you're this or you're that, you cannot be both. Okay. On the other hand, let's look at d equals 3, space-time dimension d equals 3. In space-time dimension d equals 3, the, uh, the little group is SO2. Now, SO2, if you think of it as a compact group, also has integer representations. But remember that quantum mechanics represents symmetry operation up to phase. And that has the effect of replacing groups by covering groups. Now, the covering groups of SO2 is R, just translations in one dimension. And we know that the eigenvalues of, uh, uh, of this group are continuous. They're just labeled by momentum. OK? So SO2 from group theory needn't have discrete representations, and in fact does not in quantum mechanics. OK? So you could start with a particle that has spin half. Turn on interactions, and its spin can be renormalized away from half. Okay, you can start with a particle that has spin zero. Turn on interactions, and skin spin can be renormalized away from zero. So it's possible to imagine a description where you start with a fermionic dis description, turn on interactions, and the particle has spin I don't know one fourth. But you start with a bosonic description where, where it started with spin zero. Turn on interactions, and the new particle also has spin one fourth. And in fact, then it's possible to imagine that these two theories describe the same physics. Okay? And this happens in a quite remarkable way in two plus one dimensions. Okay? Uh, many of these things were discovered in TIFR. Okay? Now, the, however, at least as far as we understand, at least as far as I understand today, these phenomena cannot happen in three and a, uh, four and higher dimensions. So, you know, Duality has the ability to interchange bosons and fermions in two dimensions, we just saw it. Also in three dimensions, in a slightly more non-trivial, oh, non-trivial, slight, slightly different, more, slightly richer way. Uh, but uh, as far as we understand, that's impossible in four dimensions and higher. Now, you know, it's always dangerous to make no-go statements in physics. This cannot happen. Somebody finds something. You made some assumption in your way of thinking. Uh, okay, and fine, possible, but as far as I understand, cannot happen. There must be some, some strange way out, around. Interesting, right? You can have both Fermi duality, two dimensions, three dimensions, but not four or six, five or six, as far as I understand. Okay, fine, let's continue. Okay, fine, fine. So you remember the setup. Sorry, this was meant to be a two-minute recap. It's gone. Anyway, you, rem you, rem you remember the setup of what we were discussing, what we were discussing, right? Now, at the end of the last class, we also computed various things. We, we look, as you guys said, we looked at these Roman sector ground state vertex operators, which, which were e to the pi, h by two, looking only at left-moving sector. Okay, and we also computed the dimension of these guys. The dimension h was equal to one by eight. P squared by 2 is the formula. So P is half. Half squared is 1 fourth times, uh, times half. This is 1 by 8. OK, very clear. OK, now we wanted to check the consistency of this whole prescription directly from the fermion point of view. So I wanted to be able to compute that the dimension of this uh, Ramond, the ground state Ramond operator would be 1 by 8 directly from fermions, just to be, feel sure. So how do I do that? So last, at the end of the last class, I left you guys an exercise. I hope some, someone has done it because you can help me when I make mistakes. Okay. Uh, the exercise was to compute the ground state energy. Um, the ground state energy, the Casimir energy, in the ground state of the Ramon sector. Okay. So let us remember, in the Ramon sector, we had psi is equal to um, psi was equal to, actually we will do it both for Ramond and NS sector, but let's first do it for Ramond sector. Psi is equal to uh, psi 0 e to the power, I mean, okay, let me just, the, the frequencies of the harmonic oscillators, uh, n is equal to 0, 1, 2, up to infinity. 
Remember that we had one oscillator with, with frequency zero, two with frequency one, two with frequency two, and so on. Okay. Now we've got a fermionic harmonic oscillators. Bosonic harmonic oscillators carry ground state energy h bar omega by two. Fermionic harmonic oscillators carry the, the reverse ground state energy minus of h bar by two uh, h bar omega by two. This is why in supersymmetric theories, for instance, these things uh, uh, these things can cancel each other. Okay, so um, the, uh, the the sum that we want to do, okay, the sum that we want to do that captures the ground state energy, is equal to minus of minus of one plus two plus three plus four. Okay, and with a factor of two because there are two two such. Let me do it for one and then I'll multiply by two with it. Okay. You know the answer to this one is, we worked it out for the boson, same calculation, except that we have a minus sign. Okay, we worked it out for the bosons, so we got minus of minus 1 by 12. Did we get 1 by 12 or 1 by 24, did somebody remember? 1 by 12, Ma minus of 1 by 12. Okay, excellent. Um, so, the... Uh, uh, um, uh, ah, and we ha also had this factor of half, h bar omega by 2. Okay, so we have half, so for one of these we get plus 1 by 24. Is that clear? But we have two of these fermions, so this Casimir energy will be equal to uh, so, in the Raman sector, gas energy is equal to 1 by 12. Okay? So, this is the Casimir energy. Great. Now, what we wanted to do is to use this to find the uh, um, uh, ground, uh, the uh, dimension of the uh, Raman sector ground state vertex operator. Okay, but you remember that in the bosonic theory, yes, half because h bar omega by two is the formula. And why a minus? Because it's fermions. Um, why why minus? It's let's remember why it's why it's plus for bosons. Okay, uh, I mean you you can get this from the quantization. See, you have a you had a a dagger plus a dagger a. You know, when you work out the energy formula for uh, um, for uh, bosons, it appears as a dagger minus a dagger a. Okay, and uh, then uh, then you rewrite this with the commutator. So you write this as uh, um, you write this as a dagger minus a dagger a plus a, da a dagger a. Oh, how does it work? Sorry. Uh, Sorry, just not. Just how, how do we get the half for Bosa? Yeah, there. Exactly. So we got the plus because of this, right? We took this AA dagger and we wrote it as commutator plus A dagger. We like to write the harmonic oscillator Hamiltonian as normal order, right? We like to write it as A dagger A plus whatever number. The calculation gives us A dagger plus A dagger A. So we, now we have to take this and write it as normal order. So we get this extra factor. We reuse this identity and write this as uh, omega by 2. This is 1 because a, a commutator a dagger is 1. So uh, 1 plus 2 into a dagger a with an h bar. This is how it works for the bosons. Okay, fermions. Okay, excellent. it's the same, same thing. Two, because there were two, right? Because we had two harmonic oscillators at every frequency. There were psi and psi bar. Is this part clear? 
that we have two harmonic oscillators at every frequency? It's clear, right? Because we had the commutation relations were psi 5 with psi bar minus 5 give one harmonic oscillator. And psi bar 5 with psi minus 5 gives a second harmonic oscillator. Is this clear? OK, because we had two. OK, great. Excellent. So let's continue. N equals 0 is interesting. There's only one harmonic oscillator. But it's 0 point energy is 0 because it's omega is 0. The formula is h bar omega by 2. But if omega is 0, it's not there. Right? Is this clear? OK. And this you are doing what I'm saying. Oh, I'm doing a cylinder. We're doing canonical quantization. Sorry, I should have started from the beginning. Suppose we were doing. What? On plane, this corresponds to zero. On plane, we'll see what it corresponds to. That's what we're trying to do, right? We're trying to find the dimension of the operator e to the power ih by 2. We deduced last time that e to the power ih by 2 is the ground state of the Raman sector. The gr ground state of the Raman sector is ground state of the Raman sector on the cylinder. Hey, when we talk in Hamiltonian language, we're talking on the cylinder. Is this clear? We're doing canonical quantization, just simple physics, no fancy stuff. Stuff you could have done three years ago, four years, undergraduate. Right? Uh, that's the cylinder picture. Is this clear? Uh, I'm glad you're asking these questions. I'm sorry it's not clear. Please keep asking. If it's not clear, ask. I should have been clear. But this, this calculation was on the cylinder, just like it was in the boson, bosonic theory. Casimir energy calculation. OK? Is this clear? OK, excellent. So we got that the Casimir energy was 1 by 12. OK. Now, remember that we got a similar formula for the bosons. We got that Casimir energy was minus, um, uh, for the bosons, we got minus 1 by 24. Because we did the same calculation, but we didn't have the doubling with 2. And we had a minus sign. L0 was minus 1 by 24. And, but that corresponded, as Chintan was alluding to, to the identity operator uh, on the plane. Identity operator had dimension 0. How does minus one, 1 by 25 match with 0? It matches because of the shift due to the, what is it called, Schwarzian. Delta, the dimension, is equal to h plus c by 24. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, is equal to energy plus c by 24. So let's say h. h is equal to e plus c by 24. That's the right formula because of the Schwarzschild. e is not quite equal to, the energy is not quite equal to the scaling dimension, almost up to this constant shift because of the Schwarzschild thing. You remember this, right? OK. Therefore, in that case, c was equal to 1. We put 1 by 24, it cancels the minus 1 by 24, giving us 0. That's how it will work for the bosons. Now we're going to use the same formula. So uh, h is equal to the energy, but energy we've just deduced, it was 1 by 12. OK? Uh, uh, so, so we've got the energy uh, and plus c by 24. OK? But c is equal to 1. You remember the C is 1, right? We've got two Fermi. One real fermion has C equals half. We are dealing with the theory of two real fermions. So C equals 1. So this is equal to 1 plus, let's say, 2 plus 1 by 24, which is equal to 3 by 24, which is equal to 1 by 8, which is exactly the dimension of the, uh, the, dimension of the vertex operator we deduced. Is this clear? OK. Now, for this to be completely satisfying, um, we should also work it out in the Ramon sector, in the uh, NS sector, and check that it's working. OK. Let's take 10 minutes to do that. Yes. Sorry, say again. 
I can't good here, you see. One by r, yes. R is equal to one. We then need to keep the r because we've already done the calculation. For the calculation, r was very important. So you could distinguish what terms are local and what terms are not. But we already had the answer here. Uh, in what I'm going to be doing now, I'll keep the r because we'll have to do a new calculation. Okay, so let's try. Let's take the NS sector. Okay, now in the NS sector, what do we know? We know that the ground state, we know that the ground state is, uh, um, yeah, the, the, the uh, operator dual to the ground state is identity. That has dimension zero. So it had better be that the ground state Casimir energy of the NS sector is equal to minus 1 by 24. So that the shift by plus C by 24 can give you 0. But is it true? It sounds a bit funny, right? Because bosons gave us minus 1 by 24. How are fermions also going to give us minus 1 by 24? The question clear? OK. So just for satisfaction, let's work that out. OK. So what is the calculation we want to do? Now we will add uh, Arjuman's R. So we want to do the calculation. Now, the big difference, of course, it couldn't have worked if it was just integer quantized, because then it would be the same as the bosons, but with an opposite sign. But, if, but the NS sector, the difference is it's half integer quantized. So there's a new calculation. OK? So what we have is uh, 1 by 2R plus one, uh, 3 by 2R plus 5 by 2R OK? And then we have half into 2. Half is because we have h bar omega by 2. And 2 is because we have two fermions. OK? This is the quantity. And of course, we have a, mi uh, we have a minus sign because these were fermionic harmonic oscillators. OK? So this is the quantity we want to compute. So we want to compute minus of 1 by 2r plus one, uh, 3 by 2r plus 5 by 2r. Uh, that's what we want to compute. Now, let's do the same thing that we did before. OK? The thing we're going to do is to weight this by some function of p by lambda. It's very important here that the weighting is with something intrinsic. And the intrinsic quantity is the momentum. You know, we shouldn't weight with some function we make up out of R, out of uh, N. Because the physically measurable thing when you're at short distances is what momentum you have. OK? And so the thing we're going to have to weight by, this F function, is the actual physical value of the momentum. OK? Uh, it's basically because we want to replace we, we, everything, every divergence we get, we want to replace by, you know, we want to absorb into a local counter term. And local counter term only sees local physics. So it sees physical quantities, not quantities you have invented. OK? So the P here has to be the momentum, which was, so let me write this more. Let, let me write this as, uh, minus sum over 2n minus 1 by 2r, n is equal to 1 to infinity. And then we will wait by f of a 2n minus 1 by uh, 2r, that's the momentum, times lambda, uh, divided by lambda. Is this clear? We're going to regulate our, this sum in this manner. Why is it 2n minus 1? Because I want the first guy to be 1, the next guy to be 3. n equals 1 should be 1, so that works. 1, 3, 5. It was because we were in the NS sector. In the NS sector, the fermions were anti-periodic. So the momentum was half integer. You remember, right? OK. 
Now, let us uh, continue. Let's now make the change of variables 2n minus 1 by 2r is equal to um, uh, is equal to x. Okay, so first first thing, what are we going to do? We're going to once again use the okay. We're going to use this formula, which you remember this euler maclaurian sum, which is f of zero by two. So you want to sum from zero to infinity, right? F of zero to two plus f one. So let me write this as f of zero and make this plus one. Just to make it easier. f one plus f two. This is equal to uh, integral 0 to infinity f of x dx minus f prime x by 12 dot dot dot. None of the dot dot dots will be important for us. This is the formula we're going to use. Is this clear? Okay. So we're going to use that on this quantity. Okay. So first let's just use it. So um, let me call this g since I've written f. The, the weighting function is g. Okay, so let's use this on this quantity. So what is f? f is equal to 2x plus 1 divided by 2r into g of uh, plus 1. 2, 2x plus 1 divided by 2r lambda. Right? Once I make that identification, I can, I've got the right sum, so I can use the right hand side. Clear? Okay. So now what we want to do is to compute integral 0 to infinity of 2x plus 1 by 2r f a g of uh, 2x plus 1 by 2r lambda. I, no, I didn't even stop to tell you what this g was. This g was this way, this, this function that decays for when its argument is large compared to 1. We did this last time for the bosons. I'm assuming you're remembering. Please stop me and ask if it's not clear. Is it clear? This was a regulator function. So g, g is some function that looks like this. Where this is scale is order 1. Okay, so when momentum is much larger than lambda, you get zero. So it regulates the sum, right? I'm sorry if this is being disjoint, but okay. So this is what we want to compute. Is this clear? Okay, minus f prime x divided by 12. And, you know, this would have been the case had we taken f of 0 by 2. But really what we started with here was f of 0. So we will have to add a term which is plus f of 0, uh, plus f of 0 by 2. Now this correctly computes uh, our sum. Is this clear? Okay. So let's compute these things one by one. Let's first deal with these guys. What is f of 0 by, uh, f of 0 is um, uh, f of, is this, it's 1 by 2r. This is equal to 1 by 2r and this at some small value is basically 1. That's what we wanted of our regulator function. Okay, so this is just equal to 1 by 2r. What about this guy? What about f prime? For f prime, ah, oh, thank you, thank you, one by four, thank you. Then we've got f prime. F prime can hit g. The derivative can hit g, or it could hit here. But if it hits g, it pulls out a one by lambda, which is zero. Because we're going to we're interested in the large lambda limit. So it's only the derivative hitting here that is of interest to us. Okay, so that's minus uh, 1 by 12 r. This minus 1 by 12 r is the same thing we had when we looked at bosons and in fact gave us the minus 1 by 12. 
when we were looking at bosons, since it was integer spaced, uh, there was no analog of this term. Because f of 0 was just 0. Right? We had n is equal to uh, 0 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3. We didn't even write the 0, because, but it's just 0. OK, so f of 0 was just 0, so that, there was no analog of that term. OK, but here we've got this. And then we've got this integral. Now let's look at this integral a bit carefully. OK, this for, uh, in order to look at this integral, let's make the change of variables y is equal to um, uh, 2x plus 1 divided by 2r. OK, um, once we make this, um, uh, no, and maybe maybe we'll make it with a lambda. Y is equal to this. OK, once we make this change of variables, uh, this quantity gives is lambda square. One lambda because we need an extra lambda here to make this y. Second lambda because we'll need an extra lambda to make it dy. Uh, then uh, a lambda squared uh, r, please check if I've got it right, integral y dy g of y. But now let's look at the limits. The limits are 1 by 2r to infinity. Ah, 1 by 2r, thank you, lambda to infinity. Thank you. All good? Now, this integral we'll write as lambda squared r into the integral from 0 to infinity minus the integral from 0 to 1 by 2 r lambda. That's the same as this integral. The integral from 0 to infinity is just a number because it's just integral y, g of y, dy. It has no parameters in it, it's just some number. This is the part we're going to absorb into the local counter. Okay? It can be absorbed into a local count counter term because no reference to r. It's a, apart from, of course, this overall r, which tells you that it comes from the integral of a local counter term. Just a cosmological constant counter term equal to lambda squared. Again, I'm going fast over the logic here because we've dealt with this for the bosons. But please stop me if you're not understanding. Is this clear? So this part is the kind that can be in, in absorbed into a local counter term. None of the others can. Let's look, let's evaluate this guy. This guy, it's over very small values of, of the argument because it's lambda. So over those small values, g can be set to 1. So we just have y dy, so that's y squared by 2. So this guy evaluates to lambda squared r. This is what it is, whatever it is. We don't care. This is what's going to be absorbed into local counter. Okay? Minus. This guy is 1 by 2 r lambda, the whole thing squared, by 2. y squared by 2. Is this clear? OK? So apart from the stuff that's absorbed into local counter term, we have this extra piece. Now lambda squared and lambda squared cancels here. r and 1 by r squared becomes 1 by r. And this becomes minus 1 by 8. OK? So we have minus 1 by 8 r. It's going to be a miracle if this is the right answer. Wait, sorry, one. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's work out what we're getting. Okay, so we get uh, uh, oh, okay. Uh, I suppose LCM is one by twenty-four. Twenty-four into minus two uh, minus three plus six. Um, ah, but there was an overall minus. I've, in all these calculations, I've not taken the overall minus to come. 
such minus click minus one meter amazing <laughs> okay what I wanted to emphasize in this calculation is how careful you have to be not about mathematics this kind of trivial mathematics is the easy, easy part of physics right about the physics okay it would be very care, very easy if you were not thinking clearly to say okay I can absorb this into a local component the integral I'll absorb it to, it's a big guy I'll absorb it into a local computer that's totally wrong because you can only absorb things whose analytic dependence on R is of the form linear order in R anything with a 1 by R you cannot absorb into a local computer and this piece had a 1 by R in the local computer uh, I'll leave it to you to play around with but you know you could have got different answers if you did not uh, make sure that G was a function of the momentum if you made G of N for instance and regulated it at large capital N okay you can end up with different answers you have to be, keep your wits about you about what you're doing physically okay and then you get these, uh, these com computations right okay excellent so this minus 1 by 24 is what we expected because minus 1 by 24 uh, plus C by 24 so the 1 by 24 gives you the dimension of the identity operator is this clear okay uh, fine I'm sorry this has taken so long okay um, now let us come back to the structure of bosonization and examine the partition functions okay we uh, I'm in the rest in the next 10 or 15 minutes we're going to discuss this the GSO projection okay look I told you that um, uh, I told you that uh, the, well we know now that the oper the operators e to the power i n plus w, w by 2 uh, h e to the power i n minus w by 2 h tilde okay we know that these operators are the zero mode sector operators uh, on the bosonic side uh, in addition of course you have uh, as many derivatives of h's as you like okay that is the full spectrum of operators on the on the two sides okay now let us notice the following look at the left moving charge of this guy the left moving charge under the charge operator charge current de generated by the current del H you remember we talked about this symmetry last time each of the two sides of the theory had this u1 symmetry a left moving u1 and right moving u1 the left moving u1 the current was del H the right moving was del H tilde or del bar H tilde and uh, on the uh, uh, fermionic side the currents were generated by psi psi bar and psi, psi tilde psi bar tilde you remember this right so let's look at the charges of operators under these u1 currents okay of course the charges of operators are in front of your eyes because pl is the charge under del h and pr is the charge under under del h bar because del h was generating translations and momentum is charged under translations is this clear somehow today everyone's looking blank i'm, I'm not being clear i feel please stop me it's is it clear I am not sure do you want to check I, I, is it clear to you guys that the charge under translations under del H is uh, for e to the power i h alpha is let me check that since everyone to my eyes is looking blank let me just check that for a moment okay so suppose I take del H of z and e to the power i alpha h okay the charge under the symmetry generated by this current is the pole in the OP that statement is clear right from these contour arguments we kept going through so what we want to check is what is the pole in the OP okay so let's 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 do this computation so we got uh, uh, we can let's just let's just do it by series expanding so this is del H of Z 
times n i alpha h n by n factorial. Now, when we contract this, there were n choices. So that gives us n h of z with h of 0 gave us minus log z. So there's an i alpha left over. There's an i alpha n, sorry, OK. Uh, i alpha n minus log z, and then i alpha h by n factorial to the power n minus 1. Is this clear that this is the, oh, uh, and then of course 1 over z. This is clear. Sorry. Uh, oh, sorry. This, there would have been a mi minus log z, but we take the derivative. Right? So, so it becomes 1 over z. So minus 1 over z. Okay? Now this n cancels with this to make this an n minus 1 factorial. Okay? And the sum continues, so this is just e to the pi alpha h. So we get minus i alpha into um, uh, e to the power i alpha h. And so we have concluded by z. So I suppose what we need is that the current is this. Yeah, sorry. So the current will be this. So the minus i goes. So we will get alpha times this. OK. You could ask, why did I say the current was this rather than without the, without the i? You, that is necessary so that, the op, uh, so, that um, the, so that this is the Hermitian operator. So that this operator times itself will give you a two-point function with a positive rather than negative co coefficient, okay? which, we, which you can also check. Just do del, del h z, del h z op. OK, I'm not doing it for you. Is this, is this clear? Huh? OK, so that, 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 that was why we needed this i, and we get this i. So the point is that we get alpha by z, but the coefficient you got times z, that coefficient was the charge. So alpha is the charge under, under translation. This is saying something trivial. It's saying that under momentum, sorry, under translations, momentum is the charge. This was the, uh, the current for translations. Right? OK. Uh, I'm sorry I'm going so slow today, but somehow everyone's looking a little uh, dazed. Maybe I'm not being very clear. Please stop me. OK, excellent. Uh, uh, this one over z, you have to take the pole. We have to take the residue of the pole. OK, so this, this was the pole. This was the residue. The residue is the same operator times its charge. Right, so it tells you the commutator of q with this operator is alpha times operator. Clear? Another thing when you say you are putting i there, yes. if I take the OP or del is 3, del is, del is 0, hmm. but if I do it, I get 1 over z square. Uh, you, that's right, you get 1 over z square. Even if I don't use i. Oh, you get uh, the, the wrong minus sign, let me check that. Uh, uh, let's check, del h of z times del h of 0. So this is equal to del z, del the other side. OK, so let's make it del z square with a minus sign, uh, minus log z. Uh, now if you do this, so that minus and minus is cancelled. So del z of log z, first time is it squared. First time you take the derivative, you get 1 by z. Uh, and second time you take the derivative, you get minus 1 by z square. So you get a minus. Right? If you did it without the i's, it's negative. But you want it positive. Okay, you want it, the two point function of Hermitian operator should be, a real operator should be positive. Is this clear? Yeah. So last time uh, we did the correspondence of uh, e to the power i h, which was psi, right? Yes. Uh, so we are looking at e to the power i h because do, those are the primary operators, the state alpha square by uh, alpha prime is k square by 4. What about del h? Uh, we did not actually see what was the... Problem. We did. 
Uh, I don't know if you remember, but when we took the, uh, uh, the OP of psi with, uh, 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 with e to the power i h, with e to the power i h 0, we expanded it. We found that one of the terms in that expansion, you remember we had to do some, something plus something and something minus something. In that something minus something, we found that psi psi bar mapped to i, uh, I del h. Yeah. Oh, so psi psi bar was del h. Yes. So the current on the fermionic side was current on the bosonics. Okay. Yes. Okay. Excellent question, sir. Keep, keep going. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Clear? Okay. Uh, okay. So. What I wanted to say was that we looked at those operators that we wrote right at the uh, top of the board, and its left moving momentum, its left moving charge under the uh, conserved current was n plus w by 2. The right moving charge was n minus w by 2. Now let's add those up. Let's take PL plus PRs. We get 2n. Okay? So you see that fermions. Okay, um, you see that what we are getting in, um, uh, 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 of course, there were also operators which are like del H's, but they carry no charge under this. So it doesn't change this calculation. So for all allowed vertex operators in the problem, on the bosonic side, the sum over left moving momentum plus right moving momentum was an even integer. Now, let's translate this information to the fermionic side. Okay? Remember that so let's, let's compute the operator. Let's, let's take the same operator, e to the power i, I'll call it charge, q. q left. Uh, so, so let's call the charge under this psi bar psi. So charge under psi bar psi. For current psi, whose current is psi bar psi. Let's call that Q. And I'll call it Q left. And similarly, psi bar tilde, psi tilde is Q right. Okay? Since charge maps to charge, once again on the fermionic side, we see that Q left plus QR right is equal to 2n, so some even integer. Now, is this clear? Any sector. I had charge half on the left and minus half on the right. Be because we had e to the power i h by 2 times e to the power minus i h tilde by 2. Why? Because we said w, this, the same w, right? Okay, so the so it's true that the charge is left on the le left and minus half on the right, half on the left and minus half on the right. So the sum was an even integer, namely zero. Okay, excellent. Now, what can we say about this this charge Q L plus Q right? It of course the current for that is psi bar psi, and psi carries charge one under this current. Psi bar carries charge minus one. Psi tilde carries charge 1, and psi tilde bar carries charge minus 1. Okay? So, suppose we take the following quantity. Suppose we take the following quantity. e to the power i q times, uh, times pi. Where Q is equal to QL plus QR. Okay? This quantity e to the power i Q times pi has the following property that it evaluates to minus 1 when Q is an odd integer and evaluates to plus 1 when Q is an even integer. Okay? Note that Q is always an integer. There are halves on the left and halves on the right, but the same half on the left and right. So you'll never get a, uh, half integers when you do when you sum q. This clear? So this quantity here, this e to the power i q pi, 
is something that evaluates to minus 1 when q is odd and plus 1 with q when q is even. Now, this quantity e to the power i q pi anti commutes with psi and psi bar. Why? Because psi carries charge minus 1 under this. Okay? So it increases the charge. Sorry, psi carries charge 1 or psi bar carries charge minus 1. So it increases, these operators increase or decrease the charge q by 1 or minus 1. So it takes even charge to odd charge. That's clear? Okay, so this is an operator that anti commutes with all fermions. Okay, and we sometimes uh, write this quantity, we sometimes give it a name, we sometimes write it as just as a definition minus 1 to the power f. Okay, it's a quantity that changes sign when you add or remove a fermion. Okay, so if you call f, so uh, roughly speaking, you can think of this f as the fermion number. Okay, it's something that's minus one on a state that has odd number of fermions, and plus one on a state that has even number of fermions. That's roughly how you want to think of it. But precisely, it's defined by this quantity. Is this clear? Certainly, if you have a state which carries minus one to the power f plus, and you act, at it, act on it with a fermion, it'll turn into minus one to the power f minus. Is this clear? Now, what we have concluded from here is that this operator, which I'm going to, by maybe abuse of whatever, this operator, which I'm going to call minus 1 to the power f, because everyone does that, okay? This operator is always 1 on all our sectors, or on, on all our states. That was the content of saying that PL plus PR was an even integer. So q always was an even integer. So minus 1 to the power, e to the power i q pi was always 1. Okay? So the bosons are telling us that, the firm, that in the fermions, we should not be looking at all states in the fermions. We should only be looking at those states that obey e to the power i q pi uh, is equal to 1, or minus 1 to the power f is equal to 1. Notice that Q is the sum of a left-moving and right-moving charge. So sometimes people write e to the power i q l pi as, as minus 1 to the power f l. And e to the power i q r pi as minus 1 to the power f right. And then this, uh, this equation is sometimes called minus 1 to the power f l plus f right is equal to 1. Okay? Now you can ask, is this something we knew to be true? And unless you've studied this before, I mean through the logic of my lectures, you didn't know it to be true. We've already talked about how modular invariance will demand having not just an NS sector, but also a Ramon sector. But now, the bosonic theory was modular invariant, right? Okay? And we're seeing something else. That required not just that you have a Ramon sector and an NS sector. It required that we don't look at all states in the Ramon sector and all states in the NS sector that we look at only some states. In fact, we look at only, we project our theory down to the sector where minus 1 to the power f is equal to 1. This is called the GSO projection. Okay? So, in the fermionic theory, we are supposed to impose the GSO projection. Now, you could, please. Why would there be other states? Like, Why would there be other states? Okay. Because psi and psi bar always form a pair. Let's look at the NS sector. Okay. Let's look at the state psi in the NS sector. Psi, psi left and zero right. This guy has minus one to the power f equals minus one. Because the bosonic, the vacuum had minus one to the power f is equal to, uh, is equal to. Let me. This will be clearest in bosonic language. This was e to the power i h times 
identity. This carries charge zero on the right moving sector and charge one on the left moving sector, momentum one. So this would carry um, a minus one to the power f is equal to minus one. What is this uh, allowed? I mean, before we had this discussion, you would think it was allowed. Right? It's, it's the Hilbert space. If you do canonical quantization, it's just obtained by taking one harmonic oscillator, the uh, alpha minus one, and acting on the vacuum. What's wrong with it? Okay. The claim now is that we are for, we are supposed to project the Hilbert space that we get by canonical quantization. So it's a highly non-trivial claim. It's not something obvious. But is that some consistency problem? Or yes. What is unphysical about the state? You see, what we need is the following. What we need is that all the operators in our theory are mutually local. Suppose we had only NS sector operators. Then they're all mutually local, of course. All something you build out of psi and has only poles. No problem. But now we're adding the Ramon sector into the game. Ramon sector has, let's, let's, let's look at this. Let's try this state out. This, we can look at it in bosonic language. In bosonic language, it was e to the power i h z, e to the power i, um, let's say h tilde of zero. Okay. Now, let us compute the op of um, this state with uh, the state which was e to the power i, h of, uh, uh, sorry, this was nothing, right? Identity, i, z. Let's compute the op of this state with e to the power i, h by 2, e to the power minus i, h by 2. Oh, that's 0. This is the Ramon sector vacuum. If we want this operator to be included in our theory, okay? Then uh, uh, we want to check whether this guy and this guy are mutually local. Is the question clear? What we're checking is that clear? Okay, let's let's now do the calculation. Okay, so the OP of right moving with this is trivial because right moving it was identity. So we'll get e to the power minus i h zero by two. Nothing tilde. Nothing changed. Everything is the left moving sector. In the left moving sector, we get, uh, we'll get, of course, the normal ordered guy, which is e to the power i h of z. So I'm doing op of this with this. We get this times e to the power i h of 0 by 2. And then the normal ordering factor. You remember a mnemonic for the normal ordering factor? You take the, co the contraction of this with this and then exponentiate. This with this has a minus sign because of the i square. It has another minus sign because of the, uh, because h has a minus log z. So that's plus, and then it has a log z. So we get square root z. This is not look. Is this clear? The thing was that we are trying to marry two sectors together. In one sector, psi is periodic. The others, uh, on the plane. The other sector, psi is anti-periodic. And if you didn't know anything about it, you would think that if you take, took OPs of operators in one sector with the other, you will get half integer powers. As you see, we get. Is this clear? This is unacceptable because it tells you that correlation functions of your operators are not single valued. Okay, correlation functions have to be numbers. You have to get a definite answer to your correlation function, depending on where you are in Z. If you've got the square root, there's a, you could get either plus or minus, you don't know what the answer is. I'm not seeing why it is important from the, just on the cylinder. On the cylinder, I just... On the cylinder, you could do what you want. Right, on the cylinder, you could do what you want. But what we're trying to do is to define a well-defined conformal field theory with well-defined operator, uh, you know, operator, op correlation functions of operators. See, what we're trying to do is to define a theory that is well-defined on any manifold. 
For instance, we, want, we demanded modular invariance. We demanded that it was well defined on the torus. If you are just interested in studying the spectrum of the theory on the cylinder, then it's fine. And also, you didn't even need to introduce the Ramon sector. You could have got away with the NS sector, or got away with just the Ramon sector. I mean, just as a spectrum of a Hamiltonian is fine. But we want more structure, right? OK? Ex yes, it's sufficient because we know that the bosonic theory is well defined. So if we get the same spectrum as the bosonic theory, if we do the projection that reduces us to the bosonic theory, we're good. Because if you remember in our discussion of periodic bosons, one of the things we checked is that a mutual locality of the operators of, of this thing. So this is just a special case of something we've checked. So if we land on the bosonic theory, we're good. No, I meant the locality. Ah. Uh, is the locality sufficient for modular invariance? Um, yeah. You know, um, not quite. It's a little stronger. Um, the, the modular invariance is a little stronger. OK. Um, you know, maybe we'll do this sooner then. Uh, uh, when we study lattice theories, this point becomes very clear. When you take many, fr many bosons and try to put a lattice compactification, and then you put consistency conditions on the lattice by demanding all consistency requirements. Locality gives you one condition, and modularity gives you another condition. The condition of modularity implies the locality condition, but not quite the other. There's a little more. OK. Um, uh, yeah, so modular, you know, the way people talk about conformal field theory is that if you have modular invariance of the theory on the torus and all one point functions on the torus, then that guarantees that the theory is well behaved on every. So this is the way people say it. That, that in particular guarantees locality. Yeah. OK. Excellent. Uh, yeah. We can maybe go through that discussion soon, if uh, certainly not today, but uh, maybe we can go through the discussion of lattices. Yeah. Maybe we can complete our discussion of free theories. Uh, but OK. Sorry. So anyway, so was this clear? The the reason that we uh, uh, need to impose this GSO projection is we won't get modular invariance or we won't get locality. The stronger requirement, as Chintan asked, in this case, they may be the same. In this one, one circle case, I says, in fact, I think they are the same. In fact, we proved they were the same. If you remember, we proved that uh, the only, all theories that were local came out of uh, a compactification on, on a circle for this one case. Do you remember that? We, we checked that this thing gave locality. And I don't know if we checked in class, but I, certainly I told you that if you just impose the condition of locality, you get the same, the, the, the same answer. So in this case, just locality is, this, is, is enough. If I just look at the spectrum of uh, the theory on a cylinder, yes. and I just computed the part integral on the cylinder, yes. given that I'm identifying the two ends of the cylinder, yes. uh, would the boundary condition be different that I could make uh, the uh, partition function not uh, modular in well, you see, if you did that, you would be anti-periodic boundary conditions on the time, and uh, or anti depending on whether you're working in NS or Ramond. Uh, let's say you were working in uh, NS sector, you would have anti-periodic boundary conditions on the circle. If you're working in the Ramond sector, you'd have periodic. If you're working in Ramond, clearly it's not working. Because tau goes to 1 by tau will interchange anti-periodic with periodic. Yeah, but let's say I added uh, the contribution from both the Ramond and uh, NS sector. Yes, you added the contribution from both the Ramon sector and, uh, and imposed no projections, you're saying. And imposed no projections. Yeah, it's not modular, in fact. It's not modular. Because, because of some boundary condition theory. Mm. Ah, good question. So you're saying, suppose I just take this fermion and, and I add uh, the, uh, OK, you have to tell me exactly what you want to do. I, are you going to put the, the OK, so I suppose what you want to say is that you will put the left movers and right movers together in the NS sector. And the, 
if left mover is an NS sector, right mover will also be an NS sector. We have many options for what you might. You could do also have a sector, you know, something where you've got NS and R and so on. But uh, uh, okay, but um, you, let's say that you want to uh, do the uh, this uh, minimum thing. Uh, yeah. Uh, and you want to ask why is it not modular invariant? Yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, can we first discuss what is modular invariant? Then we'll come, come back to the question of why. Because there are the, the tree of possibilities for what you could try to do is very large. Okay. It'll, the discussion will become more focused once we discuss what works. And uh, then we'll come back to that. In the end, um, you know, the, the, anyway, let's, let's do this and then. It's a question of chiral theories often lose modularity. So let's uh, uh, lose everything. Okay, so uh, uh, let's, let's discuss this and then come back. Okay, excellent. So, um, uh, good. So what we, what we need to do is to impose this GSO projection. Certainly the Boson, Boson theory is telling us we want to impose the GSO projection, which was, uh, uh, which was uh, uh, minus one to the F is equal to one. What does this mean in the NS sector? In the NS sector, it means that the total number of fermionic excitations built on top of the vacuum has to be even. You can put two in the left moving sector, zero in the right moving sector, or one in the left, one in the right, or zero in the left, two in the right, but you can't have one fermionic excitation. You can't have totally three fermionic excitations. Okay? What, what does this mean in the Ramon sector? In the Ramon sector, um, this um, is this, it means the same thing if we start about the same, about an appropriate vacuum, right? Remember that in the Ramon sector, there are two vacua. There's the up vacuum and the down vacuum. The up vacuum and the down vac vacuum, one is e to the power i h by two, and the other is e to the power minus i h by two. Okay. Now, the up vacuum and the down vacuum, it's, uh, um, it's uh, uh, minus one to the power f differs by minus one. Because e to the power i h by two carry has charge half, e to the power minus i h by 2 has charge minus half. Okay? So it differs by minus 1. The charge differs by minus 1. So if one of them, you know, the, the relative fermion number between the two is minus 1. So let us start with the, the vacuum which was e to the power i h by 2, e to the power minus i h by 2. This h tilde. This is a legal vacuum in the, in the NS sector because it has minus one to the power f is equal to zero. What would be illegal is e to the power ih by two, e to the power ih by two. So if you started with the up vacuum in both sectors, that's not legal. That is projected out by GSR projection. Okay? From the firm, from the bosons, of course, we see it. we see it. It's just the fact that we have n plus minus, plus minus w by r, w by 2. So if you took one w, w equals 1 on one side, e to the power ih by 2 becomes e to the power minus ih by 2 on the other side. So this is a legal vacuum, and the other one, the flipped one, where you flip which one has minus and which one has plus, that's legal. But both same is not legal. Okay? And once we've identified our legal vacuum, so this is okay, this is not. And e to the power ih by 2, uh, e to the power i h by 2 is okay, but e to the power minus i h by 2, e to the power minus i h by 2 is not. That's clear? Okay? And then once we've identified our vacua, then the rule is the same as for the NS sector. On top of these vacua, you have to put a total number, even number of excitations. Okay. Now, uh, uh, there are two, three things we want to do. Oh, I'm so sorry. I thought we would com 
move on to orbifolds. Anyway, today let's finish. Let's at least finish our discussion. Um, there are two, three things that we wanted to want to do to complete our understanding. Okay. The first thing we want to do is ask why, at least intuitively, this procedure. Okay, at least intuitively, why this procedure gives us modular invariants. Okay, and this will help answer your question. Okay, let us look at the following thing. Something else I didn't tell you about here, uh, but is obvious if you think about it, is the following. If you're in the NS sector and for light left movers, you're also in the NS sector for right movers. Why is that? Because NS sector was just HL, um, PL, and PR both being integers. But from the formula, one was n plus w by 2, the other was n minus w by 2. Okay? So the difference between them was w, which was an integer. So if one was an integer, the other was an integer. Okay? One was half integer, the other was half integer. So not only did we, uh, did we have to put the JSO projection, we also get the rule that if the left moving sector is in the NS sector, right moving sector is also in the NS sector. And if the left moving sector is in the Roman sector, right moving sector is also in the Roman sector. Okay? So now I'm going to write down our partition function. The partition function of our theory. First, let's look at NS sector. I'm going to first write it down as, an, as a diagram. Then we'll convert the diagram into formulas. Okay. In the NS sector, we projected, we did the following projection. Trace of 1 plus minus 1 to the power f by 2. Trace in the NS sector. And if we were in the Ramon, we were computing trace of uh, Ramon 1 plus minus 1 to the power f by 2. Do you see that this is what we have to compute if we want to impose this projection? Because we want to impose a projector that will keep all states with minus 1 to the f, but throw away states with uh, minus 1 to the f equals 1, but throw away all states with minus 1 to the power f is equal to minus 1. And this projector exactly does that. Okay? So we, these are the traces we want to compute. Let's con so this plus this, because we have NS sector plus Roman sector. Let's, let's write this in terms of diagrams. There's the half in both. I've just taken the overall outside. First, there's one. Now, I'm thinking of this is space and this is time. In the NS sector, things are anti-periodic because the torus is simply the cylinder identified as along the lines of your question. Okay? So we have anti-periodic. Now, Every, every time left mover is anti-periodic, periodic light mover is also anti-periodic. Because if you're in an NS sector, you've got, you're in an NS sector. Okay? Um, so, we, we have anti-periodic, anti-periodic. So, I'm not, I'm not going to keep track of both. Okay? I'll just write A. Okay? So, we have this anti-periodic guy this way. And here, we have anti-periodic both anti-periodic, left and right, because trace turns into a path integral with anti-periodic boundary conditions for fermions. Okay? So this translates to this partition function. Is this clear? This was time, this was space. Is this clear? What about this guy? This guy translates to, remember minus 1 to the f was fl plus fr. Okay, so this flips periodicity both for FL and for FR because minus 1 to the FL times minus 1 to the FR. Okay, this guy flips periodicity for both FL and FR um, in the time direction. And so we have P and A. Is this clear? Okay, excellent. Then, in this sector here, okay, uh, what do we have? 
This guy in the Ramon sector was periodic, periodic, periodic. Everything will be periodic, periodic, anti-periodic, anti-periodic. Okay, uh, this guy was periodic, but this guy one was anti-periodic. Okay, and then plus we have periodic and periodic. Is this clear? Okay. Now, let us take, you know, uh, your question. I'm going to give an interpretation to your question, you know, because of the many possibilities you might be thinking of, I'm going to choose the one that is most likely to work. Your question might be taken to be, suppose I don't impose the GSO projection, okay? But I look at both Ramon and Nebuchadnezzar sectors. Exactly. Uh, what you would get then is A, A plus A, uh, sorry, P A. Isn't it clear that this is not modular invariant? I interchange this cycle with this cycle. It's different, right? Okay? Let me recap. The basic point is that traces for fermions have one kind of boundary condition. Okay? So if you put different kinds of boundary condition space, you'll never get modular invariance by just doing the trace without the minus one to the n. Okay? Now you might have thought, let me just try, okay, since we said this before, but I'll say it again. Let's drop the, uh, the problem is coming from the Ramon sector. I didn't like it anyway. I'll drop it. What about just this? This looks good because A gets exchanged with A. The problem is, what about this cycle? If something is periodic as it goes, anti-periodic as it goes here, and anti-periodic as it goes here, it's periodic as it goes there. So if you choose that cycle, uh, it's not got the full SL2Z invariance. Okay, this quantity here does. No matter what, because you're just putting all possibilities. No matter what you do, okay, um, let's just as one check. Let me move to the time cycle becoming, let me see what this becomes when I choose this to be my time cycle. This guy goes to, and leave this as a space cycle. A maps to A, but this goes to P. Because for the reason we mentioned. Plus, A goes to A, but this goes to A. Because anti-periodic times periodic is anti-periodic. Okay, plus, now let's look at this. P stays P, but this goes to, this stays A. Plus, P stays P and this stays P. And these two got interchanged, but the whole sum has not changed. Whatever you do, it will be in invariant. Uh, okay. So, the, right. So the thing was that modular invariance puts funny, had it been that the trace for fermions was periodic, then if you took periodic in space, you would, that would be fine. Uh, you can of course define that except it's zero. Um, it's not a very interesting quantity. If you take PP, it's zero. Can somebody tell me why it's zero? Yeah. I'm claiming that actually um, this quantity here uh, uh, is zero. What? Because it's minus one to the f. Ex excellent. So tell me why. What cancels? Excellent. So Chintat's got it. He says, if you look at this from the Hamiltonian point of view, it it's a, tra a computing trace with a factor of minus one to the f. But we have two ground states which have carry no energy. Okay, but they carry opposite values of minus one to the f. So you have a whole Hilbert space that you can build up on top of the first ground state, and a whole Hilbert space that you can build up on top of the second ground state. Each of them has finite energy, I mean, nice partition function, but they're equal and opposite because minus one to the F cancels. That's from the Hamiltonian point of view. From path integrals, can somebody tell me why we will get zero?
When do fermionic path integrals give you something zero? D alpha over something that doesn't involve alpha is zero. Where alpha is a, what mode does not appear in the Lagrangian? The zero modes. They don't appear in the Lagrangian. That's why they're zero modes. So the integral of the coefficient of the zero modes, you take your path integral, you expand it in coefficients of modes. For the zero modes, the modes that are zero in space as well as in time, huh? those just don't appear in the Lagrangian, the integral over them gives you zero. Okay, so what I've told you here is that this guy is modular invariant. Yes, in fact, what's more, what's also true is that modular transformations shuffle these among themselves and these among themselves. This shuffling for the particular case is very simple because it's just shuffling zero. Okay, but when you see, we wanted a restriction that came from a well posed you know a well posed projection on our hilbert space we want that projection we need both those terms and modular invariance of correlation functions works only if you have the whole thing you you know if you drop the pp and try to find correlation functions it feels unmotivated on physical grounds and will not work on uh, for correlation functions so you know you need the, need the whole thing okay great any more, any questions or comments before we proceed? I'll take like five, ten more minutes. I'm sorry. Uh, questions or comments? Okay. Uh, right. Now the last thing I wanted to do was to work out the formulas for these, these diagrams. Okay. And uh, uh, these formulas are very easy to work out because each of them has a very simple Hilbert space interpreter. Let's start with, uh, let's start with this guy, which is the easiest of the lot. Okay, what, what was our theory? It was in the NS sector. We had fermionic harmonic oscillators of, uh, um, of, uh, uh, of energies, half, three halves and so on. Okay. And we had two of them. So can you say that the partition function here is um, is product over n, 1 plus q to the power n plus half. n is equal to 1 to infinity. 1 plus q tilde r to the power, or q bar, so n plus half. And then whole thing square. Right? Why? Because you see, every harmonic, fermionic harmonic, harmonic oscillator gives you one because when it's not occupied, plus a factor of q to the power l0 when it's occupied. But l0 was n plus half. Okay, so you had this thing here, this thing for the left, right movers, and you had two of each of them. This is almost correct. What I've, neglected to account for is the zero point energy. Okay. So, uh, what I've neglected to account for is the zero point energy, but the zero point energy we know, um, we got uh, uh, Q to the power, what did we get? Q to the power minus one by, tw uh, by 24 uh, and Q bar to the power minus one by 24. So this is that formula. Is this clear? Okay. What about this guy? Okay. This is also NS sector, except that it's got a factor of minus one to the power F. So every time you add a fermion, you have to add a minus sign. So can you see that this will be Q, Q bar, the same zero point energy, minus one by 24 times product n is equal to 1 to infinity, 1 minus q to the power n plus half, 1 minus q bar to the power n plus half, and then the whole thing square. Because every time you add an oscillator, you have to add a minus sign. Second partition function should be related to the first 
second partition function should be related to first partition function by module. I think you're right. I think you're right. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah, with the appropriate. Yes, exactly. Because of that. Yeah. Exactly right. Excellent. OK. Now let's look at the Gromon sector. Let's first do this guy. This guy we just evaluated. It's easy. It's 0. Right? But let's open out that 0. OK. Uh, we'll open out the 0 after evaluating this guy. OK, so number 3. Um, let's see. So now what do we have? We had two ground states. So from the 0 modes, we get a factor of 2. OK? Then we have zero point energy. Zero point energy here worked out to what was it? Plus one by twelve. Is that right? Plus one by twelve, then minus one. Yeah, we got plus one by twelve because it was like minus one by twenty-four for the bosons, but there were two of them. So the minus plus. So q q bar to the power one by twelve. Okay. And now we have simple, n is equal to 1 to infinity. We've accounted for the zero modes. So it goes from 1 to infinity. 1 plus q n, 1 plus q bar n, the whole thing square. And we'll open out the zero. The zero was um, the zero was uh, uh, one minus one. That was this two. So that's why we got zero. But apart from that, it was very similar to here. The minus sign because we're doing with insertion of minus 1 to the end. Okay? So the transition from those formulas, those diagrams to formulas, is very simple. You see, you don't need notes, so you don't, you just think about it, right? Right? It's really easy. Now, uh, we've written these things explicitly, but people who, uh, Jacobi and friends, worked very hard with these kind of functions. Uh, Jacobi and friends worked very hard with these kind of functions uh, 150 years ago, or 100 years ago, whenever they were born and died, I don't know. So some time ago, <laughs> okay. And uh, uh, the, the reason they looked at these functions was that these functions have nice modular properties, okay? So using the work of, you know, using, if you don't know anything about physics, you go to a mathematician, you give him the sum of, sum of quantities, well, he'll say, fourth guy is zero, so I won't worry about it, but the sum of the first three is nice and modular. There is something else. This partition function, if we've done everything right, should also equal the partition function of the boson at r equals 1. That partition function was written, we wrote down in an earlier lecture. I'm not going to try to write it down again. OK? It didn't look exactly the same. In fact, it had this sum over, uh, sum over p and q, and so on. OK? So, You've got two functions that if we've landed on our feet have to be the same. It doesn't look like they're the same. Okay? But there are these, uh, the, the Jacobi and friends and, you know, all of, and all of those guys were very smart people. Without knowing any physics, they worked out lots of identities in mathematics. And one of the identities they worked out was the equivalence of the bosonic form of the partition function and the fermionic form of the partition function. Now, if I try to name the identity, I'll get it wrong some. Some, it has some fancy name, but you can read about it. OK, um, what you can do, of course, if you don't believe Jacobi and friends, is to take this function, put it on Mathematica and say uh, series <laughs> up to n equals 100 and check. OK, and uh, you find that it's correct. OK, so this is quite a remarkable thing, which of course happens again and again in physics that you take some rather deep mathematics, at, at least from my point of view, very sophisticated mathematics, 
And that mathematics, which from mathematics is quite sophisticated, comes out from almost trivial considerations in physics. The partition functions of these two theories should be the same. But when you compute them, you get different answers. Therefore, they have to be the same. Of course, you may have made a mistake in your physics. You have to check. But once you've, once you've checked, it gives you a very lovely derivation of these identities that doesn't require mathematics. OK, uh, this is all I wanted to say about bosonization. Uh, apart, perhaps I will try to read up on your Jordan whatever, Wigner, if that's the right word, transformation, and see if I can say something more physical. I, I, I took a condensed matter course as a PhD student, which talked about it that way, but I haven't thought about it in that language since. It's not in my mind. OK. Um, OK. But I, I, about bosonization and the fer, at fermions at uh, this value of the radius, this is all I wanted to say. Uh, now, there were two other things I wanted to talk about, but free bosons, unless we also go into the lattices that you guys were referring to, um, which we could also, it's quite nice stuff we could do. Um, uh, but uh, um, the things I wanted to talk about were the following. I wanted to talk about bosons at another value of the radius. We took the radius 1 which was square root 2, 1 by square root 2 times the self-dual radius. But there's a more distinguished radius, right? Which is the radius square root 2, which is the self-dual radius. And if 1 is so nice, meaning that the, firm, the boson on this radius turns out to be a fermion, square root 2 should be even nicer somehow, right? I mean, if there's any justice in the world. Something very nice should happen at radius r equals square root 2. Something ni very nice does happen in R equals square root 2. The theory develops an SU2, SU2 times SU2 symmetry. Um, in fact, it's the simplest example of a, or one of the simplest examples of a Cartmody Kach algebra at level 1. Okay, so I wanted to tell you a little bit about that. Okay? And I also wanted to tell you about orbifold theories. Okay? Uh, and once, once we uh, go through that discussion, we will have learnt about all known C equals 1 theories. I'm not sure if there's a proof, but at least the space of all known C equals 1 theories is very simple. It's, uh, let me draw it this way. The theories we've discovered at C equals 1 so far can be written like this, can be written as a line. The line is the, li is the radius. It ends at square root 2 and then goes on to infinity. And you might ask, why, why not below? But below is the same as above because of T duality. Okay? So we've got, got a sort of half line of theories like this at C equals 1, labeled by the radius. Alpha what? Alpha equals 2. Everything is alpha equals 2. Okay? Now you might have asked, well, what about two fermions? And we've discovered that we can look at two fermions that has C equals 1, but it's the same as a theory here at radius equals 2. In the class, I've worked it out at radius equals 1. But if you interchange momentum and winding, this is the same as radius equals 2, right? T duality. OK? So this was our distinguished, um, this was our distinguished uh, uh, theory here. OK? And something else interesting happens at 2 square root 2. The, thing, this thing, the, the uh, interesting thing that happens is that there's a new line of C equals 1 come, theories which are orbifolds. I haven't told you about this. There's a new line of C equals 1 theories that comes and meets this line at this point. And this moduli space um, is the complete, as far as we know, moduli space of all C equals 1 two-dimensional conformity theories. Okay? So com I'm not sure if there's a proof for a classification, but certainly it's widely believed that there, is, there are no more C equals 1 theories than these, than these things. Basically, to give you this complete picture, I want to talk about this orbifold and also talk about this, that special theory at, uh, at the end of this branch of mod moduli space. Okay. Last thing, and I'll let you go. I'm sorry I'm taking so long today. But uh, the last thing I wanted to say was this. In, um, in answer to Arshal's question, um, I hedged giving the answer at the beginning um, for the following reason. In everything we did here, we treated Ramon and Nebu Schwartz, we treated left and right movers the same. So left movers were in Ramon sector, right movers were in Ramon sector. 
If left movers and right, nebbish short sector, right movers and right, nebbish short sector. If left movers had a minus one to the f, right movers had a minus one to the f. Now, from the, Bose, from the Bosani point of view, that was demanded of us. But Harshal's question was not that. It was like starting from fermions, why couldn't we do something separate? So you could ask, suppose you try to now treat left and right separately. What about doing this kind of projection for left movers? And separately, this kind of project for right movers and multiplying the two. In, by which I mean, how about separately imposing the projection minus 1 to the FL is equal to 1 and minus 1 to the F right is equal to 1? Okay, is the question clear? Suppose I impose the projection. Minus 1 to the FL is equal to 1, minus 1 to the FR equals, uh, F right is equal to 1. Then instead of getting these kind of mod squares here, this and this, okay, I will have something times something else. You know, there will, there will be a whole answer from the left moving sector times an answer from the left. Right. We'll do the sum first over the left moving sector and mul multiply with the sum over the right moving sector. Okay? And at this very naive level, if you think about it, nothing changes. Parity. Okay, uh, that's fine. I mean, I, I would have to think about that statement, but uh, uh, it's a very minor thing. Like, let's say we'll lose parity, maybe, though maybe it's related. Maybe it's part of SL2R. I thought, so, uh, moving along this direction in uh, tau is somehow different from moving along this direction in tau because you are not including all the Yeah, but you know, we're not treating left and right different. We're imposing minus one to the FL on left side and minus one to the FR on right side. So it's not like we're treating left and right movers different. So we're not breaking parity in that, in that sense. Okay. However, what we are doing is this very dangerous thing. What we are doing is acting as if the left moving fermions can be treated separately from the right moving fermions. Now, the problem with this is the following. You know, determinants to be to be to evaluate determinants, you need a regulator. Okay, and if you if you add let's say Pauli Villas regulation regulator, that couples left with right, because the Pauli Villas regulator is adding a you know some very heavy mass term for some spectator field whatever, it's some, something that that. Couples left with right will not be consistent unless left and right move together. If you try to do things separately on the left side and the right side, unless you have a regulation scheme within which it's clear that modular invariance will work, it's possible that it will not work. Okay? And this is what happens here. When you try to, when you do separate things with the left and the right, the fact that you cannot consistently regulate your path integral in a way that preserves the other symmetries, comes back to hit you. Okay? And in fact, if you do this problem, you do exactly what I said, and you try to work it out, tau goes to 1 by tau continues to be preserved. But tau goes to tau plus 1 uh, gets an anomaly. But it's an anomaly mod 8. By which I mean is if you if you take this and have not sorry in this this case mod four because we have two fermions, you take four copies of the same, same fermion and do the same thing, then that thing lose that anomaly is gone. Okay, so this if you treat left and right separately, you may or may not land on your feet, and if you had a total of eight fermions, you land on your feet. And this is tightly related to the fact that ten-dimensional superstring theory makes sense. Bot period is probably, yes, eight, yes. Uh, so eight fermions, tw tw uh, 16 fermions, 24 fermions, all makes sense. Okay. Um, uh, so, um, so that's why that kind of thing didn't show up. Here we were not systematically exploring all possibilities. We used the boson to guide us. But it, there's nothing else that works. Okay, I'll stop here. Sorry for taking so long. <laughs>